Hello everyone and welcome to I think the first session of the second day of the Creative Coalition. Before we um, get started I just want to say a massive thank you to Creative UK who've done an incredible job pulling together an amazing group of speakers and I've been dipping in and out of sessions for the last couple of days um, and we are almost exactly halfway through so there are loads of great sessions coming this afternoon and then tomorrow as well. Um, and I work at YouTube and YouTube are incredibly um, proud to be supporting this event and, and partnering with Creative UK and all of the amazing people who are kind of coming to watch it and who are joining the session for today. Um, before we go any further, I will introduce myself. So my name is Gemma and I work at Google um, and I'm in the partnerships team specifically working with the music and creative industries in the UK. And what really excites me about this job is that I get to work with the arts and the arts really matter when lockdown kicked in, we all turned to the arts for sanctuary, for solace and for entertainment. So whether that was watching a play on the National Theatre YouTube or watching a live stream from your favourite artist, this is where we turn to um, and culture really matters and it really matters who makes it. Um, and probably the best part of my job is getting to work with incredible partners in the music industry on our Future Maker programmes, which are here to support emerging artists on both sides of the mic. So Future Maker artists are um, singers, songwriters, they're producers, composers, but they're also uh, artist managers, marketeers, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and none of these programmes um, could happen without the incredible partners that we work with. Um, and I'm very, very excited to welcome some of them today. So we have Paul Bonham from the Music Managers Forum, who we work with on the Accelerator programme. Amina Badley, who is an artist manager and actually went through the Accelerator programme in 2020, I believe. Um, Charlotte Dryden, who is a massive force of nature in the culture industries in Belfast and is the CEO of the OES Centre, who we work with on the Scratch My Progress programme. And then Dan Williams, who is the programme lead at Youth Music, and we work with, alongside the People's Postcode Lottery, on the Incubator Fund. Um, and I'm going to turn over to them all to tell us a little bit about how they got started in the industry. But today, the Future Maker session is going to be focusing on um, how we can kind of level up access to the creative industries around the UK, um, how we as an industry should be making changes and changing our mindset about how we're supporting emerging talent, um, and actually how does regionality affect your access into the industry. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Charlotte first to tell us a little bit about how did you kind of start off in the music industry? Yeah, thanks very much, Gemma. Um... Oh, uh, how I started, I, I have a bit of a checkered past. Um, I got into the industry probably quite late, as in the age of 29. Um, but I think the common thread for me, right from a, being a teenager, was my absolute obsession with music and going to festivals. So um, I started by pretty much myself, because here in Northern Ireland, you'll probably find that 90% of music um, people are self-starters, DIY. A uh, very small industry. There are no record labels to apply for jobs for. There's no agents, um, and we've got a small sort of grouping of managers. So for me, it was very much um, jack of all trades in terms of music. So music journalism, promoting gigs, DJing, um, putting myself forward for projects, and pretty much being a freelancer in the early stages of my kind of change of career into music. So that's kind of how I started out, and then. Um, the uh, position here at the OES Centre came up and um, all of those things um, combined really helped me um, probably get that job in the bag 13 years ago. So I've been I've been here 13 years now. So that's that's kind of my journey in a, in a nutshell. Amazing. I'm going to go to Paul next. Thanks, Gemma. Um, yeah, I'm Paul um, Bonham from the Music Managers Forum. Um, my entry into, um, I guess, culture or the music industry, I think it's really important to recognise the role that youth centres played for me. We had an amazing youth centre that put on an arts festival. Um, and I guess that was the sort of entry into me just becoming uh, a, music, a, a promoter um, and an artist manager by um, working with what was around me um, and having adults around me that encouraged young people to take leadership. So after uh, school, I, I did move to London and do a degree in media, but I became involved in something called Truck, 
which was a music festival um, and it was enormously supported by parents and the village that the event took on um, and that connected me to the industry um, at large and we had a record label and then I fell into management and then I worked you know it go, goes from there but I think the route was a great youth service and, and brilliant adults around giving their time. Amazing we're going to talk quite a lot about that probably a little bit later. Um, Dan I'm going to go to you next how did you start in the creative industries? Thank you, Gemma, and great to hear from Paul that he started in youth centres, um, which is a big part of what we do, youth music and supporting youth centres. Um, so I, I was pretty DIY. I, I was like just experimenting in my bedroom, trying to make music on the computer and totally kind of isolated. I didn't really know that much about how to then progress that. Um, but what I did know was how to use the software. So I, I started volunteering by going into youth centres and helping young people learn how to record and make beats and do, do that kind of stuff thing um, that then went into a kind of career in youth work and advice and guidance um, and then eventually kind of working on apprenticeships and employment schemes um, none of which were in music but then became more into the, the cultural sector around kind of 2010 when the cultural sector started to think about internships and access routes and apprenticeships and um, so I got very involved in, in, in that world um, and then sort of worked on how to policy and how to give out funding, which is which is how I've moved over to Youth Music, which is uh, a national funder supporting young people to make music. So I've been here about six years now, um, managing grants, working with organisations, and now on the kind of partnerships fundraising side and, and setting up new programmes to help emerging talent. So yeah, it's been a bit of a journey that kind of makes sense in hindsight, but um, these things always sort of do. I feel like that's something that's coming through quite strongly is none of us have had a straight line. And I think particularly for people who are starting in the creative industries, just to say, I think we can all probably agree is you won't have a straight line. And we all have these kind of patchwork careers where you, I think the days of starting off doing something and doing the same thing 10 years later are very much gone, particularly when you're working in the creative industries. Um, I started off just to give you guys who are watching a bit of uh, background. I came through University of Westminster, which I think people have been talking about in the chat quite a lot as well. They've got an amazing creative arts programmes and I did the commercial music degree, which um, many people didn't really know. I can remember someone talking about the, uh, creative, the commercial music degree in the kind of university newspaper and they just said, none of us are quite sure what they do or how they're learning to be in the music industry, but we think they might just push flight cases up and down corridors all day long which wasn't quite um what we did but that is kind of how I started and that's kind of what my route into the industry was was through the kind of quite traditional uh university route but Amina I'm going to go to you next and first of all I'm going to ask you how you got in and then I'm going to chat to you a little bit more because actually it was a conversation that you had with the other accelerators that kind of inspired this panel and um, so how did you get started in the industry oh you're on mute sorry guys sorry about that um, so I got started off in the creative industry actually 10 years ago. Um, I started off in fashion. So I started my own fashion label and then I was doing the marketing and just every part of the fashion bit. And then I started working with a magazine and I was doing their marketing. Then I, and one of my friends just got on tour with Kano and I was like, cool. Um, and he needed a manager and I was like, well, he was like, can you be a manager? I didn't have a clue. And then became his manager. The year that I wanted to leave, my younger brother starts rapping uh, Mowgli and ends up being a superstar. So yeah, that's how my story happened. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I love that just kind of opportunistic. I don't know how to do this, but I'll give it a go. I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so like I said before, it was a conversation that the you were having with the other accelerator managers. And for those of you who are watching who aren't quite sure what the accelerator program is, it is a uh, program that we developed with the Music Managers Forum, who were the world's biggest kind of representative trade body for artist managers. And there was a real gap at this kind of manager point who are kind of at the turning point of their career where they're just starting to really kind of make money and artists are kind of working hard and they're maybe leaving their job and not quite sure how to... They, how to kind of what the next steps are and then we realized there weren't any kind of training courses that were supporting people at this turning point um and so we launched the accelerator program in i'm going to say 2019 2018 um i think it took two years of working on it and kind of building it to, before we launched it and amina was on the second year of the accelerator course and there was a retreat that paul very brilliantly put on for all of the managers from the years 2020 and 2021 because of obviously lockdown we'd never come together and there was a conversation on the last day between amina 
um, and some of the other accelerators about actually, if you come from the regions, Mina was talking from kind of from a Birmingham perspective, it's very difficult to even know that these jobs exist, let alone figuring out how to get into it. And there was a great quote from Gaius who was talking about how he was in a room full of 80 rappers and he himself wanted to be a rapper as well. And then realized if there are 80 rappers, like who's taking care of business? And that was actually the first time he started to think and look at, there are all these jobs behind just performing um, the performer kind of roles. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, Amina, kind of coming from Birmingham, when you were kind of at the very early stage of your career, what did you think being in the creative industries were? What did you think the jobs of being in the music industry were? Did you know that these jobs existed or like, what was your perspective on that? Um, so when I came into the industry, like I came straight into label. Um, so straight away, I was literally having meetings with Polydor to sign Temper. So right. it was very a big juxtaposition from Birmingham and like no record labels here, no like nothing, no kind of teacher, no foundations um, to go into London. And it's like these big glossy buildings. And then you're learning about music lawyers, accountants in the music industry, um, producers, directors. And I didn't know there was all these things that went into this um PR, marketing, just all these creative assets. Um, but I didn't realise that there was so much jobs in the industry. So, yeah, very inspiring to me. And did you feel, kind of being in Birmingham, that you were slightly excluded from that world a little bit to begin with when you were younger? Like, how do you feel being in Birmingham impacted your kind of uh, sense of how you could kind of get into the creative industries? And I think we're there's this there was a chat that was going on this morning and there's been lots of chat about kind of being in the regions everyone feels like the creative sector's in London but actually what does that look like if you're from outside of London and uh... you, you know what for me originally it, you I used to think that there was no real um like you have to go to London and I was very adamant that I did not want to move to London um I've had so much offers and things like that but I really believe that regionally um, we've got a lot, there's a lot of um, opportunities here, but you just have to make them. And I think there's, um, for me, I've always been just get up and go person. So anything that I've wanted, I've just created my own. Um, didn't have any production, started my own production company, um, started my own little marketing little thing. Um, but I noticed that obviously London has the greater power. That is where, you know, the main industry is. Um, it's the heart of, it's the heart of UK creative, it is. Um, but I just think that original early in my early days, I did used to think that it was a bit, I was a bit scared of it. But what I started to realise is that London actually really embraces regional people and regional ideas. Um, and it was actually really exciting. So now in the early days, it was quite scary. But I think once I realised that there is um, a lot of attention from London our way in the Midlands, like there, there's a lot of attention. So how do I connect them dots now and utilize that to make something that's beneficial? Um, yeah. So yeah, I was Amazing. scared. I'm not anymore. <laughs> I can't imagine you ever being scared of me. <laughs> um, Charlotte, and also really interested from your point of view of coming from Belfast. There was a lot of chat um, in one of the sessions this morning about how Channel Four was moved to Leeds and the BBC is now in Salford. Do you get a sense, sense that the kind of creative industries are looking and kind of supporting the regions as much as? You would like them to be i think especially kind of around funding that comes in supporting the creative industries but more specifically looking at the lens of emerging talent like do you feel part of that kind of industry or do you still feel slightly left behind and kind of forgotten about in any way i think things have improved dramatically over the last few years we definitely were um a bit of a wasteland or felt a little bit set adrift from everybody else for a very long time but I think things have definitely improved. We've got way better connections now with the wider industry and way more support than I, I think we've ever had, you know, including from the likes of yourselves. But um, PRS Foundation, we're part of that talent development network, which is, you know, a really important network and helps connect us to the rest of the UK. We're forging better connections with the south of Ireland because... While we're on the same island, we're, you know, technically set apart and, and, and even the influence of media and different funders can have a major impact on our relationship with the size and lack of relationships. So things have changed immensely. Um, Belfast is becoming um, a really international and recognised city and we've just become a UNESCO city. So I'm hoping that that will open up opportunities. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I, I do think sometimes that... Um, people don't aren't aware maybe of the opportunities but that's why 
the likes of the OES Centre that I work for exists. We are trying to signpost people to funding opportunities, to networking opportunities, um, and to, to any, any opportunities that come along that, that will be um, of, of support. And I think, you know, the access to space is really important. I'm sure we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more about, about that. But um, there is definitely more investment coming into Belfast, uh, but I think, you know, there's still a long way to go. Um, and, you know, uh, we've recently just completed a study on Belfast and Northern Ireland around music and the creative industries and 82% of people are DIY freelancers that says a, that's a huge amount of people that are doing it themselves so there's still still a, a long way to go in terms of creating opportunities for for businesses. Yeah and I think there's that we were talking a little bit before about how all of these regions have their own cultural ecosystems and their own creative industries that are really thriving as opposed to being seen like London coming and just kind of dropping their kind of what they want to do in that industry or kind of coming and imparting their wisdom and disappearing again it's actually it feels much more about how we can work with the kind of ecosystem and um the cultural industries that are already thriving they don't need people to come in from London to kind of um you know just do what we want to do there and then kind of come out again um yeah. Dan you obviously do with youth music you do an awful lot of work like you were talking about before with youth centres kind of around um around the UK and you were saying something interesting before about how with the incubator fund, a lot of there are a lot of people applying for that funding from London. Can you just sort of tell us a little bit more about that and how you see that kind of skew from the people that are applying for the incubator fund? And yeah, sure. So, so the incubator fund is um, a fund that we've designed to sort of join up the pathways between education and industry. And we've really aimed that at music businesses. Um, we do a lot of funding work with music charities and youth centres, etc. But this fund specifically was targeting music businesses to create work opportunities for, for young people to progress into. Um, obviously, you know, the, the industry is centred around London and that's kind of been reflected in the number of applications we've had from, from London, which is you know, around 50%, 40 to 50%. Um, so we've had to be really conscious in our decision making about supporting organisations outside of London. And, and trying to help build up the infrastructure out there because um, you know we, the applications we get all over are great and we could easily go with well the demand is here we'll invest there but um, you know we've had to take some really strong decisions about where we where we put that investment and it's at the moment eighty percent going outside of London um, and I'm really trying to um, catalyze the sort of DIY communities that are happening you know we know mm -hmm. that youth culture is not going to necessarily wait for an organisation to get some funding to 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 do what it wants to do. So what we want to make sure um, we're able to do is like, how can that, how can that DIY scene that young people are already part of, you know, how can they start to earn money from that? And how can we get youth music's funding into their hands? And the Incubator Fund's been a really great way of doing that. That's benefiting the businesses involved and benefiting those, those young people who want to take that first step into, you know, professional. Yeah. I mean, there was something interesting you were saying off the back of that when we were talking about, um, Kind of the industry you thought that particularly we were talking about the MMF before and you'd seen them but you didn't think they were for you and I'm kind of interested if you could tell us a bit more like why didn't you think these organizations were well, um so basically I think when I because I knew about the MMF from 2016 actually when I first got into music I remember speaking to a sound engineer at a show and he was like oh, have you heard of the MMF and I was just like no and I went and researched it um and it was like this membership club well yeah it's not a membership but do you know what i mean um so when i uh, when i got the application um sent to me by two of my friends years later in 2020 and um, or well, 2019 i think it was um i just thought at first i did think this i don't know this is like it just seems a bit big and it just seems very professional and maybe like the type of music that i work with is not professional i don't know i don't know why i thought that um but when I joined and got accepted, life was just just changed. But I think, um, yeah, my original perception was that it was just above me. And I know that sounds a bit sad, but I did. Um, and I learned that it obviously wasn't because, you know, it's been great. But yeah, I think that's why a lot of people from other cities probably just think, oh, it's in London. You know, I might have to pay for it or probably don't understand like the, the monetary side of it. Um, and probably just feel like it's not for them, but it is, it really is. I think that's fascinating. I'm going to look at Paul. Just to yeah, say, um, 
I mean, I, I think, you know, what, we, what we've done from the MMF, the Accelerator program is now in its fourth year. Um, and organisations, I think, um, <laughs> that are London-based with a national remit can often seem really impenetrable. But um, where we've had a talent development program with Accelerator that YouTube have supported and Arts Council England, we've been able to sort of change the, the visibility and the invitation to engage with our um, organisation. So um, it's really enabled us to highlight that there are great people all over the country doing brilliant work. Um, you know, we didn't set out to be a regional development fund. We didn't set out to be... Um, you know, a particular sort of diversity or, or, or anything. That, 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 that's part of how we operate um, is being inclusive. And I think what the programme has enabled us to do is champion leaders that were already there um, and open up the industry or the role of, of what managers are um, to be led by those individuals and, and network them with their peers. So much of what we do in Accelerator is about peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and, and my greatest feeling, actually, I start with the, the fourth year tomorrow. Um, we've got 24 new managers. Um, is that they all come into a room. It'll be a, a, an online room. Um, but it kind of bursts their bubble because they, they often think they know everything um, in their industry, in their region. Um, you know, they're in a, in a lane where they're quite comfortable. Um, and I, I think what we've... Um, well, the success of what we do is sort of burst that bubble because they often don't know anyone else that's in that group. And that allows for a space that can, um, can allow for an environment, really, of comfortable learning and, and exchange. And I think that there's not enough of that in the industry. Um, you know, the, the, the creative industries at large, actually, I think music doesn't work with gaming enough. I don't think fashion works with, um, uh, you know, design enough or retail. There's the, 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 the just bursting bubbles, I think, is what's really um, been a success. And I think that this sort of fear of um, people that are, are in regions can be quite easily um, uh, circumvented by some networking and some highlighting of where, where there really is great success going on. Um, because there's strong people um, all over the country, particularly I think now there's lots of digital um, successes and in the industry has become entirely global. You know, I've met managers that are making really, really good incomes and they're based way outside London and they're not engaging with the industry. So I think it's our role as, as the industry to highlight what, what different types of success looks like. Mina, did you want to? Yeah, um, I just wanted to chip on what, on what Paul was saying. Um, example for me with the MMF, I only had met managers in my sector. So I didn't know about um, like the pop world and like the indie world. I didn't know how big it was and you know, everything that was going on. So I think for me, it's been really great to have a network of friends and peers that they, they have a different experience from me, but we have the same experience. So I can learn from their, you know, their ways of doing things or even their different ways of marketing. Um, Charlie, who manages Joy Crooks, like she is amazing at, I'd class it as guerrilla marketing. I don't know, I'd see it as that. But she's amazing at that. And that's really inspired me with my artists. So yeah, I think the MMF is great for mixing ideas that you wouldn't normally think to do. Um, and having people literally there that you can just speak to straight away about it. Uh, so, yeah, I just thought I'd add that on to Paul. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think what's always really interesting with the Accelerator or with Youth Music and with some of the other Future Maker programmes that we work with is actually that there is this incredible network of people who are trying to do this on their own. And I think there's been a lot of chat as well in the um, Creative Coalition over the last couple of days about freelancers. And I think all of these people are not just freelancers, they're entrepreneurs, like they're all running their own businesses, whether it's just for themselves and actually building those kind of peer to peer. That can be an incredibly lonely place. And so kind of working to build a peer to peer network amongst programmes is something that I think is a really big part of what we're going to try and do next year. Or this year a little bit more of about how we can support one another and how, you know, people can come together. Um, Paul, did you want to chip in? Yeah, I, I agree. The psychology of what, what being a freelancer um, is is something that needs more nourishment and, and development. Um, you know, I think freelancers get such a hard deal um, in in society across all um, you know across all industries. 
Well, it's actually in our industry is they are the driving force. They are the majority. Um, and they're coming up with the new ideas, um, their research and development. Um, they're, they're establishing and breaking the rules. And they're also far more diverse than what we get through the, the sort of corporate corporations or institutional um, operations that are in essential but need to work and collaborate with freelancers. Um, yeah, that's that's an important, I think, narrative to change is that the freelancer is like a service role, whereas actually they're the engine of the industry, I think is um, a wise uh, path to go down. Yeah, 100%. Um, I also just wanna say, if you're watching uh, at home, you can ask questions, if you put questions into the chat, Thing that's next to you I think they they will feed back to us in some magic way and we'll be kind of answering some of those questions towards the end so any questions you've got for the team um put them in there um we're also going to talk about leveling up which feels like such a buzzword particularly today I think if you turned on the news or looked at um a newspaper today there is an enormous amount of chat um but I kind of wanted to look at that with a specific lens about the opportunity that we have to support leveling up with emerging talent and I think this is a really interesting concept for us as a as an industry and particularly for us as organizations about when we're looking to how we can support um programs and I wanted to chat to you a little bit Dan about how the incubator fund is specifically for um minority groups and kind of diverse um audiences so how do you when you were kind of developing that program and when you're developing that with a very specific lens how do you think, how did that develop and kind of what do you think the next steps are for us in industry to really focus on this as an opportunity to create a more representative and equal society and um, creative industries tomorrow? Yeah, um, so Youth Music as, as an organisation, you know, we're all about driving inclusion in music education space and then more recently in, in, in music industry space. And what we did when we started on this journey to sort of think about how we can make an impact in relation to talent coming into the industry was, you know, go out and talk to businesses, go out and talk to young people. We did a massive um, research project um, in 2020 called A Blueprint for the Future, which had the voices of 1,300 young people that had, had spoken to us about kind of what the barriers were that they were facing. Um, and also, you know, the massive opportunities that there were for them to, to, to come in. So that, that was a bit of a rallying cry from us, that, that research um, that we did and the, the campaign that we led around that was to try and say, you know, these are the people who are, have so much talent and are doing all these things, but in a kind of very DIY way, how can we actually you know, break down some of these barriers? And, you know, the, the biggest thing that we found was it was around social class and how that intersected with other um, uh, characteristics that were the biggest um, factors and determinants. It's so whether somebody was going to be able to move um, into a professional career in music and actually start earning money and being able to you know, have that as their main source of income. Um, social class absolutely you know, was was the biggest determinant factor. And um, I think often that is left out of conversations sometimes. You know, we don't, it's such a thorny issue um, in our society that a lot of the time it isn't, it isn't kind of spoken about. I think it is starting to be spoken about a lot more. Um, and so, yeah, we, you know, we developed a program which is targeting people who are currently underrepresented in the industry and organizations put forward applications to us telling us how they are going to reach those people and what we found is that the organizations who already have like a good level of representation um, within their leadership team and, and we're talking about really small businesses here you know like most 80 percent of under five members of staff um you know they're, they're really well placed to 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 to, to recruit um people who look like them and people will want to work with them and it's it, it's sort of that approach where we are investing in organizations which we think can grow and can really benefit from bringing new talent in um and uh i think that's you know how this does start to tackle some of the leveling up stuff because it takes such a long time to build the infrastructure i mean the announcements today are great but you know it's going to take billions more pounds and it's going to take many more years to sort of start changing the north south divide and we need to be realistic that it, it, it will take several, several, several years to do this. Um, but I think if we're starting at this grassroots level and trying to empower these organisations we're working with and the young people there, bring that talent through, they will become, you know, the, the, the sort of beacons of the future um, music industry. So, so our approach is very long term. Um, and, uh, you know, we are starting to see some, some, some change there, but it, it, this thing does take a long time. Yeah. Also, I think it's interesting with 
the accelerator program, for example, is not specifically designed to be a kind of like you said, it's not specifically designed to focus on diversity, but inherently that feels like something that's always been very important to you guys from the start. Mm -hmm. And have you seen a change over the kind of over the last couple of years? I remember you saying, for example, there are lots more people outside of London who are kind of participating now because people have left London. And have you kind of how have you worked to kind of make sure you've got an inclusive cohort each year? Um, and how have you been mindful about how you've kind of developed that as a space as well? Because I think to Amina's point, you are these people do come together and you are you form this little family for a year and you work together for a year really closely. And I'm um, it's kind of I, I'm interested to kind of understand how you have done that mindfully um, to make sure you've got like an inclusive set of people year on year, which Accelerator always has been. I think it's one of the and that's genres as well as, you know, um, race and, and gender and. Um, I mean, it's it, it's odd, but it doesn't feel like it is designed um, because we kind of it's almost demand led. And I think that, that because we've got the, the, the carrot, I guess, of investment um, and. I guess we've been pretty good at, at, at spreading the word about the opportunity. Um, we get a great range of applicants. We get a really, really, really good range of applicants. And then the, the sort of, you know, we score them, it goes through the decision making process and there is an element of balancing in there. Um, but I think we, we really know that the added value of what we do is about creating a peer to peer network where mm. difference is going to strengthen everyone that's on it. Um, you know, and that diversity isn't necessarily about segregation or, or, or it needs to be inclusive in all ways. So, you know, having different genres, having different um, ages and stages and, um, you know, it, it, it just strengthens everyone. Um, and also it's, it's, it's an application process that is based on the applicant identifying their needs. So um, it's about them taking leadership over what they want for their, their business and professional development. Um, so people use the, the, the investment in different ways. They have a different business plan um, and it's very applicant led. So mm -hmm. it's going to be diverse. It's going to be different because it's led by the individuals. Um, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm always really surprised when I sit down and talk to applicants about sort of what their mentor would look like. Um, and some people want a mentor that's very much like them. Um, some people want someone that's totally the opposite. And, you know, it, it, it's all about tailoring things to people's um, ways of working that are going to, I guess, coach the best out of them in the long run. So it's individuals rather than a sort of metric yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. This is a kind of question to the whole group. Then what do you think us as an industry, and I'm kind of thinking more about the private sector organisations like us, but also programmes that you guys are designing, what do you think would be the most powerful thing we could do to support leveling up um, outside of you know the traditional education in, in education kind of system and kind of looking at like you said you talked about youth centres a lot and you talked about those kind of community programs in Charlotte obviously the OES centre is such an incredible part and heart of um, the, the, the music industry in Northern Ireland. What do people think would be the most kind of important intervention that we could do and should we be designing these programs with a particular focus on diversity to help create a more equal footing for everyone? Does anybody want to take that? Charlotte? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's an awful lot that can, can be done to support what we're doing. But I think I think to begin with, um, creating, creating a space where people can, I mean, I know we have become very, uh, very good at, at working like this on Zoom, but I think that coming together, nothing will ever replace that. And I think creating accessible spaces where people, uh, like-minded people, that um, can bounce off each other, work with each other, collaborate, partner up, um, use the space. That's what the OES Centre is trying to do. So we're not taking credit for any talent in the building, but we want to develop and foster and encourage that talent. So that's about bringing people into a hub. I suppose the word is hub. We've, that was our vision for the OES Centre. We've become this creative music hub where lots of different disciplines are working with one another now. So I suppose in terms of how <laughs> industry can support organisations like ours or the, the wider thinking around that, I suppose it's, it's, um, it's taking that risk on investing on a, a hub mentality 
where there's a lot of emerging talent coming through of lots of different ages, abilities and levels. Um, they just need that space to create, but that also means that um, the organization behind it needs time to, to and, and ways to develop how we can do that. So it's rehearsal facilities, better equipped venue space, um, workshop spaces, songwriting rooms, and the, the, the mentors and the, and the individuals within it that can help those people. I think that that has made us a much stronger place having a hub to work out of. So I suppose that more investment in spaces is, think, is, is what I'm trying to say, um, certainly around different regions. Amina. Yeah, also, um, I think that um, in order to, for industries to help, like basically to help with creative process and things like that, um, I think in terms of like Birmingham, we don't really have hubs and things like that. It's not really a, a, a thing that we have, um, but there is a lot of individual kind of um, groups who have started their own, you know, either management company or just creative things. And I think that what would be great for bigger companies to do would be instead of like looking for hubs, kind of look for people in the city who are, who are um, I, I don't know what, tastemakers, I think will be the word. Um, and they're pushing through and they've got no support, but you can see that they're actively doing a lot with no support. So if these companies come behind them, it, you know, the sky's the limit, they could really push a lot further. So um, I think maybe in these companies having a individual that kind of scopes out up and coming talent, up and coming, um, coming creative talent maybe, and then kind of coming behind them and really supporting them. Um, I think that would really help because I think it's needed instead of like a hub hubs as well but I think individuals because not every regional city is the same yeah and I think what's interesting as well thinking about your kind of journey and where you are in that kind of development like two years ago when you were doing the accelerator it feels like you're kind of coming out the other side now where you're looking back at how, how do you feel do you feel do you feel have a sense of that kind of role within your community in Birmingham of like I really do I feel like a mascot um I'm joking I feel like um I you know, coming out of the MMF and really seeing the up and coming talent and like kind of not playing that big sister because because I am from Birmingham, there's not a lot of music managers in general, let alone, you know, ones that are in the city really trying to, um, you know, just work with the creatives. So I think that for me, um, kind of having that sister relationship with them and also having the, the links that I have, like the MMF and things like that, just being vocal. I'm really mm -hmm. just saying where I think that um, there's holes or things that can be, you know, made better or anything like that. Just always feeling free to have an opinion. Um, and I think that's always been welcomed with um, the MMF. So, yeah, it's always just anything I see that I think could be better. I think being vocal about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, just don't know sometimes. And that's a sense I get from actually whenever I've met people from all of the programmes here, they're always... Very, there was someone who I was talking to at um, the OES center who was just like, this is the greatest place. I've been coming here since I was 11 and now he's 19 or something. And he's like, and I'm doing everything I can to help the next generation of people. And it feels like there's that real sense of like camaraderie by people who've come through these programs. And Definitely. given that thought, that they kind of really, like there's an intent behind how they're doing that. Yeah, and I think as well, I think it's the thing, like if I knew about, well, I did know about MMF earlier, I should have decided earlier on, I didn't. But if I would have, the process I went through in 2020, if I would have went through that in 2017 when I first started off as a manager, I just don't even know where I'd be now, even though I'm you know, in great places. But I, what the MMF does and just having that network, it really pushes you forward. And I think if, like how there's Accelerate, if there's one for different creative industries um, yeah. and someone like Paul, who's really great at picking a diverse sector, um, you know, I think sky's the limit. So yeah, it's just my opinions. This isn't like a paid for advert for the MMF. It's not. <laughs> it's really <Right>. not. <laughs> um, we're kind of moving towards the end of the session. So we're going to get onto questions in a minute. But I, the final thing I wanted to talk about was, I think, as an industry, the mind shift between very early on, particularly, I think, when I started, it was like you went and did work experience, you worked for free, and that was it. And that's kind of you paid your dues and you got onto the ladder like that. And I think it definitely feels like that mindset is moving on and Dan I wanted to chat to you a bit about when you developed the incubator program because it was very much being anti that and actually that is not what we should be doing yeah yeah so 
as I said at the beginning, like my career is sort of evolved alongside many of these kind of job creation schemes and programs I've seen, ones that the government have run, runs that the sector has run. And um, what we're trying to do is kind of learn from, from what's worked. And, um, and I think, you know, there needs to be some money that goes into an organization to make these things work properly. And it does need to be sort of beyond just an internship program where you know, you're creating a job for a post that, that you want to fill. Um, and, I, and I actually don't think like having a Monday to Friday nine to five internship is necessarily reflective of the realities of the creative industries. So what we're really keen to do is make it much more flexible so that people could commission freelancers, you know, give them business advice around how to be a freelancer and how to work with an organization as a freelancer. Because, you know, as, as, as Paul was saying, they, they, they drive the sector um, and also, you know, support micro businesses, which again are at the heart of our sector, with some, some funding to do this properly at the real living wage. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we've seen a really good shift in terms of like, people approaching this as a as an investment in their own business and their own future, as, as well as the investment in, in the young talent and, and doing that for the right reasons as well. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's been a really nice shift to see in terms of having watched like a decade's worth of, of some of these sorts of programmes um, take place. And then I, I think one of the other things that we just really encourage is for people to have like leadership and autonomy in, in, in the roles that they're in. So that they can walk away with the portfolio and say, "I delivered this project. I did this," and it, and, and 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 it's not just a, a kind of experience where you say, oh, "Okay, I was there for a little bit of time and I did," but it's it's really you know delivering something, walking away with that portfolio, and being able to yeah take that lead. That's that's what we really look for, um, and I think the, the shift that we want to see in in terms of how people are approaching. Um, bringing yeah, any new stuff into, into their um, team because they have so much to give. Yeah. And it's something actually, I think if I think about all these pro projects and all of our kind of future make maker projects is that there is something about looking at the individual in a really holistic way. Like all of the projects do an enormous amount of, su of, of supporting people uh, in all sorts of different ways, whether that's through via mental health, whether that's via how to, I remember Paul saying one of the most interesting or one of the most well-loved sessions of the Accelerator is actually the bit about insurance because mm. people don't really think about insurance as freelancers, as entrepreneurs. And so it's yeah. actually, all of these projects, I think there's been this real shift behind actually looking at how can we support the individual in a really, really holistic way um, so they can do that. And I know Charlotte, you were saying as well that you do quite a lot of work about kind of backstage roles as well about developing those kind of people. Yeah. Um, you see that people are wanting to do this more. They're kind of wanting to do those kind of behind the scenes roles more than previously where everyone kind of wanted to be a singer or a songwriter. Do you see that there is a shift where people are kind of wanting to do those? There's absolutely been a shift and it's very much part of one of our, our key, key programs is to uh, make people more aware of the opportunities outside of the actual being on stage, all of those backstage yeah. career opportunities. So management, setting up your own agency, becoming a promoter touring as a guitar tech I mean you know it's way more uh, exciting than, than some other jobs that you might fall into and to know that that those are accessible roles so a lot of our programs are centered around that and I, I am the biggest advocate for talent development of all kinds not just the person on the stage but if you are showing a flair for writing a press release or you're good at marketing or you could be yeah. that manager it's about getting them to come in and use the space and talk to the people that can be their mentors within this space and that, as you say that holistic support mm. just by coming in and bouncing off other people I just think there's so much in that as somebody who grew up with absolutely no access to any support at all in the music industry and thought I had no chance of working in music I think the most important thing is to is to create um, an environment where people feel like they can ask questions they can come in they can be mentored and they can get that support it can be, you know, it can be everything from free, just coming in and, and sitting down and having a chat with people in, a, in an environment where you feel comfortable, right through to applying to a program. So it's about it for me, it is all about that access to space and bringing really, you know, um, um, ambitious people in and, and, and people are just curious in and, and, and finding your flair and, and encouraging that and fostering that. I love that phrase, finding your flair. Um, and also one of the points that I think Paul mentioned earlier is that we often think about this as like young people with are coming mm. through school. It was like it's about stage, not age. And there are lots of people who are, you know, older who are looking to either enter the creative industries or particularly I think post-COVID people are changing careers and people are moving around. Um, 
And Paul, do you think that's something that sort of needs more embedding in the industry, that it's stage, not age? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to um, bash um, anything around young people because I think that, that it's essential that there's support for them. But it's where often where they go next. Um, and, you know, with a, a, an industry where you can be DIY um, or independent, um, it's about how you sustain careers, um, I think. Um, and, you know, I see a lot of um, young people actually dash into the industry quite quick and you know you potentially can earn quite a lot of money quite quickly nowadays in the industry um but have you got the skills and um support to sustain a, a long-term career and i think that um the industry really needs to look at you know it's about investment but investment of time to um hone long-term business skills as well mm -hmm. um you know i meet so many uh music managers that don't know how to cash flow, don't know how to budget, have never done a business plan, have never even thought about these things, but they're, they're, they're making great incomes, um, you know, and so it's, it's, there is a maturity that's needed around sustaining yourself in the industry as well. And I think that we can be quite a youth obsessed industry um, because of what's next, what's coming, what's fashionable, what's on, you know, what, what's working on the internet. Um, but are we are we making really, really rich, um, rounded, long term careers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Amina, there was something else not to hark back to the conversation that we had at the retreat again. Um, but you were saying off, off the back of Gaius's point when he was saying everyone wanted to be a rapper and then I was yeah. like, who's taking care of business? And you were saying the first question you ask people is like, why do you want to be a rapper? Why do you want to do this? Definitely. Um, I think that there's. Oh, sorry. No, no, go. <laughs> Um, now, I think that there's an obsession nowadays with becoming a music artist and everyone wants to be a rapper. And, and I always do Instagram posts and, about this, like everyone does not need to pick up the mic. Um, I think that there's so much different jobs that can be that your friends or your group or just the people around you can fit into that don't have to be rappers. And I think if you look at examples like Gigs and Book, his manager um, was one of his fellow rappers um, years ago. And now he's an amazing manager and he's got an amazing act, but who need, like one of us needed to do the business um, and it, that worked out. And I think that if a lot of um, artists and people around artists realise that instead of trying to jump on the mic, you can really grow um, finances and just your career by an, a different choice. Um, and yeah, I think that's one, honestly, one, when people come to me, my first question is, why do you want to be a rapper? Because then I can understand as to if I'm going to work with you or not. Yeah. And there was a great thing you said, it's like you can have, you know, you're a great communicator, but you can be a communicator, you can have influence, you can have power, you can earn money by doing a thousand other different jobs. Literally. Which I think is a really interesting thing, particularly for like, what is, what, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I think that it's like, example, um, you know, part of the art of obviously being a rapper is communication and getting your, your voice across. But everybody in the group doesn't need to do that in that way. So, you know, you're great at networking you're great at you know going to events and bringing back some opportunities so i think that this person should do that instead of going into rapping um and i just think that there's so much wide range of jobs tour management you know um security um even like even going into um law I really think that's um music i think it's very kind of london based right now but i think it's such a big and diverse um asset that's needed regionally so um yeah i just think people should open their eyes to the different jobs in the industry and mm -hmm. it's not just at the front yeah and we said it at the time and we'll say again you'd make an amazing music lawyer should you ever want to uh, <laughs> you ever want to speak. um we're just coming up to the end we've got a couple of questions one is for i'm going to ask this one for dan which is a bit more of a broader question how can someone this is from um tony how can someone collaborate with youth music to help emerging young guys in music creation and help them have a career in the music industry. I'm feeling lots of people are going to get LinkedIn requests after this potentially. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely connect with me, connect with Youth Music. Um, I mean, there's many different ways that you, you can help. We offer funding, obviously. So, you know, we have funding for running music workshops. Um, we also, as I said, have funding for like, music businesses to support job creation and, and support young people into the industry. Um, we also run a funding string called our Next Gen Fund, which is about helping young people directly 
um, with a little bit of finance to help push a project out there. Um, so that might be something that um, the young people that individuals working with may not know about already, but but could talk to us about. Um, yeah, so just get in touch because there's there's all sorts of different ways that we can we can support and we can help. And um, you know, if you wanted to, as an organisation, you know, um, do a masterclass or any of that, those kinds of things, again, there, there's ways that we can facilitate that to happen. And we've got like 400 projects that we're working with across the UK uh, who would be super interested in in that. So so yeah, lots of different ways. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing actually from our programmes that we work with you guys is that the mentorship angle and the kind of it's not just about being able to give funding and sometimes I think people can think they don't really have much to offer it's like well no one wants to do my job but actually it's more about that rounding thing of like how to approach difficult situations and I think looking at mentorship particularly I always think it's much more about it's about the kind of holistic way you can support an individual um, and so anyone who's watching this I know organizations are always desperate for really good mentors and people who are kind of really committed to supporting people and um, there's a go on Paul I was going to say, and the, the concept of reverse mentoring, I think, isn't respected enough in the industry. Is like listening to people that are doing things different if they're younger or, you know, that's one of the things that um, I think the industry can do much better is listening to what is successful or what young people or, or people that are different to them are doing. Um, you know, you might be a senior leader, but are you learning? Um, I think we try and encourage um, all of our members to be, continuous learners um you know we want to be a learning organization and i think it's best for the industry if we're everyone's taking responsibility for that yeah absolutely there's one of our um one of the google team who is the chief of strategy for google in the uk very high powered and he's a mentor for one of the youth music um, participants who's the ceo of girl grind and he just says to me all the time like i'm learning so much he's like i don't think she's getting very much from me but i'm learning so much um, and it is a really, really important factor. Paul, very quickly, someone's asked, do you charge artists to be members for MMF? Um, yeah, the, the MMF is a professional body for people who are managers. So um, it is a small subscription. Um, there's some, an organisation that we work very closely with called the Featured Artists Coalition, which is where artist entrepreneurs can go. So um, that's what I'd advise to someone who is an artist wanting to develop their sort of skills and networks. Yeah. So very quickly, we have got um, three, four minutes left. I'm going to just ask everyone to do very quick. What would be the one piece of advice you would give to someone who wants to get into the industry? Paul, I'll go to you first because your mic's off. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, don't ask permission. You've got to be in it to win it. Dan? Yeah, similar, like make it happen. I mean, people want to see somebody who's able to actually start something themselves. So don't be afraid, even if you haven't feel like you haven't got money, there are tools out there to, you know, just get going. Um, and I think also like learn about the inner workings. I think all of us would, you know, we're all involved in some way in the industries, but there's always more to learn. I think it's sometimes hard to know where exactly to get that information from because everybody sort of comes at it from a different angle. But yeah, you know, like follow trusted people and, and learn as much as you can about the inner workings. But most of all, like do it yourself, make something happen. Yeah, Charlotte? Yeah, it's very similar. Um, but back to what I said about find your flair, you know, what are you good at? And go after the people that can then help you make contacts. And networking is, you know, so important. Talking to people, building contacts and relationships. And because opportunities will come out of that, you will, work will start to come in and you'll start to build up that portfolio. And also don't be afraid to ask questions and also don't take it personally if people don't get back to you the first time. I know it can be crushing, but, you know, you've just got to keep pushing forward. 100%. Amina? Oh, you. Yeah, Charlotte, that was amazing. I'm glad that you said that. Um, I would say, for me, it would be just get up and go. Like, just do it. Like, literally just do it. There's a way. Um, network with, you know, do your research, network with people in your spaces or in your, um, you know, locally or regionally to you that have the opportunities or, you know just reach out like I love when people hit me up and want to get experience I've had so much people along the way that I've worked with and are doing amazing different things now and it's beautiful so I think just just don't be scared just do it like literally just do it amazing so I'm just going to do a quick wrap up off the back of that which I think is all incredible advice I think as an industry what we should be doing more of 
is around actually bringing people together so they have a peer-to-peer -peer network to support each other looking at all of the incredible industries that are thriving outside of London and investing in them uh, and particularly looking at this is not investment opportunity around leveling up because these are the opportunities where you can actually give people um, a better footing in the, the career to make a more representative creative industries for tomorrow. So thank you very much for joining us. That was brilliant. Thank you very much to all our speakers um, and we will see you soon. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>